week after week for three decades, it has been the country's most widely watched and trusted source of economic and financial advice. Now, join us for this special one-hour look back at an American classic, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, the first 30 years. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's now been 30 years since I first welcomed viewers to this program, but the sentiment has always been sincere. When we started, few people thought there would be much of an audience to welcome in the first place. There was no such thing as a national television program about money in those days, and the reason was simple. TV executives and Madison Avenue vice presidents thought the subject was too dull and or too complicated to attract an audience large enough to form a bowling team. Turns out they were wildly wrong, and right from the start. People do care a lot about money. In fact, I've found it's usually one of their two principal preoccupations. They just don't want to be put to sleep in the process of learning about it. I'd already been working for more than two years as TV's first national economic correspondent and commentator, the job I filled at ABC from 1968 to 1973. So this little gig for public television down in Owings Mills, Maryland, started as an experimental bit of moonlighting, supposedly just for 30 weeks. Isn't it amazing how time flies when you're having fun? Even I, as a perennial optimist, had not suspected how many millions of weekly viewers were ready for solid pocketbook information, clear and credible, about how to make their money grow. And one of our first and best rules was not to take ourselves too seriously. So before we get to some of the really historic stuff, let's clear away the fog and take you behind the scenes. It's been a program for all seasons and some fascinating locations. Howdy. Good evening. I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Well, one thing's for sure. This is not Owings Mills, Maryland. It is, in fact, the floor of the world's newest and most technologically advanced stock market, the one-year-old Toronto Stock Exchange. For this is the OEX trading pit at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. From Tokyo. Produced Friday, May 28. Welcome to the very first Wall Street Week from St. Louis. And boy, is it about time. Well, here we are in jolly old London, and life certainly does look different when you travel to a strange foreign country. Welcome to a very special Wall Street Week from Rio. And we gave some fascinating career advice, too. To signal 30, 30 seconds, you move your fist up and down like this. That ought to clear away the wimps. Want to buy a hundred contracts at that price? Just do this. I kid you not. And for a thousand, make like an Indian. Of course, we never advocated anything as crass as gambling. You know, I've always advocated long-term investing, so I'll spring for one more quarter. Ah, you're talking. Some strange characters showed up from time to time. Eh, uh, what's up, Doc? Besides the market. Good evening, I'm Lewis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Everybody wants to get into the act. <laughs> In total darkness, its infrared illumination lets you know who's around and what they're saying. It's okay, folks. 
It's only your friendly neighborhood economic commentator. I'll be a little late for dinner tonight, Tess. Oops, wrong show. Buy low, sell high. But I tried to keep my dignity at all costs. The Wonder Bra, which is based, it would seem, on the conviction that things don't have to be precisely what they seem. Peekaboo chiffon nightgown and matching G-string. It's me. An innocent pet turtle that mutates into a fierce teenage ninja. Take that, short sellers. If your broker advised you to stay out of the market in 1995, you might want to try this Nerf secret shot on the rascal. Nerf bow and arrow sets. Just the thing for fending off overly insistent brokers. Bubble sax features the favorite instrument of our president. And will presumably be especially useful if you want a soft soap Congress. How sweet it was. Maui's Chocolates in Cleveland is offering this choice item for just one dollar, with crisp rice inside the milk chocolate. And Maui's tells me I'm the first non-athlete to have his own candy bar. Obviously, they've never seen me play second base. And the warm sentiment has always been the same, even when some wild young kid was hosting the show back in the early 70s. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Good night and have a happy and hopefully a prosperous new year. Who knew that the show was destined to become not just America's favorite money program, but a cultural icon as well? Wall Street Week is starting. He's going to miss it. <laughs> we always watch it from the beginning. We'd like to sing the theme song. <laughs> Alex, hurry! Wall Street Week is starting. Ooh, listen, uh, I'm going to skip it today, okay, pal? But I already made the popcorn and the cash register is all heated up. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Louis Rookheiser. Well, it's been an up and down week on Wall Street. The bulls who had ridden the roller coaster to its peak after gorging themselves on the cotton candy of overvalued issues. Wall Street Week. Louis uh, Rukeyser. Well, folks, I suppose it had to happen one of these days. The newest superstar in the world of money actually is a pig. Here with us tonight is our special guest on Wall Street Week, Gordy. <laughs> Oh, no, you don't! Good morning, Salem. Checking your stocks? Yes, and they're all down. Down, down, down. Well, you know, what goes down must come up. Thank you, Louis Rukeyser. When the program started in 1970, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had never closed above 1,000, let alone 10,000 but it finally accomplished this in 1972. Not long after, though, it went into its greatest swoon since 1929. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, the market's downhill run was virtually uninterrupted. By the end of the week, the closely watched Dow Average had dipped below its previous 1974 lows to a depth it hadn't seen since October 26, 1962. Few other price indexes can make that claim. The week's loss was more than 41 points to 577.60. As usual, fear soon beat greed by a landslide. But in fact, the Dow never again traded at so low a level. Still, the wise guys sneered when a few prescient optimists talked of much better times ahead. Ed, since some people incorrectly regard you as a bear because you were correctly pessimistic at certain key junctures, including 73, but in fact you've just given us a pretty optimistic viewpoint, and I've heard you 
talking about even higher figures for the ultimate future. Do you still see 3,000, 4,000, 5,000? Oh, yes. Every generation uh, has its big bull market that blows off. We had it in the 20s, we had it in the 50s and early 60s. We'll get it in the 80s and 90s. How high are we going to go? <laughs> <laughs> I would say there's a better than even chance that within six, seven, or eight years, we will see the Dow Jones Industrial Average sometime above 3,000. In October 1981, eight months before history's greatest bull market began, I interviewed a seemingly bizarre guest who turned out to be an uncannily accurate forecaster. I'm a little confused. You said we're in a bear market, but earlier you said we were going to be in a bull market. When, when do we get out of this bear market and into that bull market? The end of the bear market, the earliest I can count it is about August 26, 1982. It might be a little later. W will we go lower than we've been between now and then? Probably. But uh, I'm not one of these 600 boys. I think uh, 750 to 770 is more like the range of the final low. August 26, 1982. Now, how do you pick the day like that? And can you tell me precisely what time Eastern I use about time? seven or eight methods. The count from the middle section, the standard time spans, which appeared in the Encyclopedia of Stock Market mm -hmm. Techniques, But usually, uh, picking the exact day of a low or a high is usually the, done by the count from the middle section. Your predictions are so specific and so long range that I think the remarkable thing is not that you're sometimes wrong, but that you're ever right. I think it's absolutely <laughs> incredible. Well, even if you don't know the count from the middle section from Count Dracula, you have to admire the late Mr. Lindsay. The market took off almost precisely on his schedule. Six years after his appearance, on the eve of what became known as the crash of 1987, there was another famous bullseye prediction in the other direction. I haven't been looking for a bear market per se. I've been really in my own mind looking for a crash, but I didn't want to talk about it publicly because it's like shouting fire in a crowded theater and there's other ways to play it. You just tilt your strategy negatively and you shut your mouth. I only look for a brief decline, but a vicious one. Marty had it exactly right. A week later, after the worst crash since 1929, I offered a little reassurance to terrified investors around the globe. Okay, let's start with what's really important tonight. It's just your money, not your life. Everybody who really loved you a week ago still loves you tonight. And that's a heck of a lot more important than the numbers on a brokerage statement. The Robins will sing, the crocuses will bloom, babies will gurgle, and puppies will curl up in your lap and drift happily to sleep, even when the stock market goes temporarily insane. And now that that's all fully in perspective, let me say, ouch, and eek, and medic. And once again, it transpired, the end of the world really hadn't arrived. The Dow not only regained what it had lost, it doubled and doubled again and kept on rising. But as always with investing, there were occasional brief interruptions. Some seemed to hurt worse than others. Good evening. I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Well, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the studio. There we were, jogging along blissfully toward 10,000 on the Dow, when we fell into this huge hole and got battered pretty badly. Were you there too? Did you get hurt too? Gosh, I'm sorry. But just knowing that the misery was shared by so many nice people has me feeling better already. How about you? Again, I reassured America that patience and perseverance would bring profits. And what do you know, they did. Will we ever have bear markets again? Of course we will. But as this program has always pointed out, the way that most people are going to make the most money is by buying quality for the long term. 
not by trying to outguess the market by the kind of in and out trading that periodically seduces the unwary. We've always tried to keep you ahead of the curve on genuine long-term trends. And one of the ways was by offering the kind of expert, incisive analysis of key industries that had previously been available only to millionaires. Our guests and panelists have peered into some remarkably accurate crystal balls. Charlie, how serious is the energy crisis? Lou, it's large. It's going to be with us for a long time. It's going to be a fact of life which we have never experienced before, which is going to change our way of life and the future of our industrial society. Frank Capiello, Alan Ehrlich of Corum, New York, says he's looking for what he calls undervalued growth stocks. And he'd like an opinion of companies involved in the video games and video recording industry. Can you give him an answer live? Well, I think so, Lou. Uh, video games is the rigging of your television set to uh, play electronic hockey or electronic uh, tennis. And uh, it's a growth area. Three million sets sold uh, last year. That's up 10 times from 1975. Uh, but it's a tricky area. And uh, the company I like in this area, and I think there is growth here, uh, would be a company called Warner Communications. Uh, this is a company that not only has a fine subsidiary, Atari, which produces the games, but uh, also has other things, motion pictures and so on. Uh, selling at six times earnings, I think it's undervalued. Video recorders, this is an entirely new area, about a year old as far as the residential uh, home market is concerned. The leader here in uh, taping TV shows and showing them again on uh, set is uh, Sony with its Betamax. Uh, fine, uh, fine operation, but I much prefer the Matsushita system, which RCA will market very shortly. And um, it's a good way to play the, uh, uh, the system. Uh, and RCA may be a good turnaround candidate. I think the movie industry for the next, oh, let's say three to five years in terms of theatrical uh, viewing in theaters, I believe it's going to continue to be approximately flat. In other words, two and a half to three billion dollars a year will be spent on it. However, I think that the actual viewing of movies is going to increase dramatically as it has been doing over the last five years. This is going to happen on video cassettes. This is going to happen on pay cable. In five years, what's going to be the most significant difference in TV from today? In five years, what's going to be the most significant? There will be four major networks. Fox will be the fourth, with a news operation as well? Yes. Wolfgang Demisch, who has just been made a vice president of Morgan Stanley, is making his fourth appearance in four years on this program, which shows what we think of his consistently highly rated analyses of aerospace and defense stocks. On his last appearance as my guest in May 1980, I asked him what further events might be anticipated on the international security scene and he replied, and I quote, well, God only knows, Iran invading Iraq, Libya trying to bump off President Sadat, various things which affect our interests fairly directly. Well, if that kind of precision in public forecasting is rare anywhere on any subject, what does your crystal ball tell you now about the international scene? Well, I'm hopeful peace will break out as we proceed during the course of the year. Many years before a new economy became a glib catchphrase, when technology investors were widely viewed as sci-fi wackos, some brave souls came to Owings Mills and made what may have been the most profitable recommendations ever heard on television. Our primary recommendations are Intel, which is over the counter, Texas Instruments, and National Semiconductor. I gather that the hot new word in the industry is microprocessors. Would you define it for us and tell us why it's hot? Uh, yes, the microprocessor is most simply a full-fledged computer on a single chip of silicon about a fifth of an inch by a fifth of an inch. And it is a revolution in computation. It allows you to have a computer uh, for the price of about ten dollars. And I predict Lewis, that uh, five years from now you're going to have a microprocessor in your home, in your car, uh, on your wrist, in your telephone, and perhaps in other places. Well, I certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
are, are any of the companies you mentioned particularly well positioned to take advantage of the microprocessor? Uh, there is no question that Intel, which is the inventor of the microprocessor, dominates the microprocessor field now, will probably dominate the microprocessor for years to come. I think it is probably the most exciting development in technology that I'm aware of. What other buys do you see? I think long-term Microsoft is an excellent company. Sun Microsystems seems to be coming back. But as the host has always reminded you, there are no guarantees from the management. And not every prediction made by my guests belongs in the Financial Hall of Fame. You have used uh, phrases rather more severe than the economy turning down. You've suggested that we may have the worst depression in our history. Yes, I have said uh, that we uh, probably would have a worse depression than the 1929-33 depression. But even that isn't a, an apocalypse. You know, I lived through it. You didn't. So I know what it was like. I caught the end of it, uh, John. <laughs> Howard, the back of your book says that you predict a major economic downturn, probably starting this year, with a 70% chance it will become a full-scale inflationary depression. Do you now feel that our current episode will not become a full-scale depression? Not this current one, no, no. You, what you, I, uh, in the book, <clears throat> I indicated that the other 30% probability was we'd have a recovery from this one one more time, then we'd move into that inflationary depression. Right now, I'd say it's 60-40 that we're going to find ourselves in a recession from which we will have an inflationary recovery. But I think the real inflation is going to take off sometime toward the end of 1981, which will lead us into an inflationary depression. You think we're really going to have a gold standard? Very soon. It's inevitable. What's it very, how soon is very soon? Well, very soon means uh, before Reagan's first term is up. And the movement to it, I believe, will begin before next spring. Do you think uh, Disney will get NBC? I think there's probably a 40 percent chance is my bet at the moment. Uh, I think GE uh, is interested in selling if the price is high enough. Uh, of course, they haven't really come out and officially said they're going to sell, uh, but the easiest uh, deal to happen is one with a private company, uh, a division of a company, uh, so it's much easier to negotiate with GE for NBC than it is to go and try and buy uh, one of the other network companies. And how about CBS? Who, who's going to get CBS? Well, Mr. Tish says that he isn't interested in selling out at all, and anybody that says anything different from that doesn't know him at all. Does Chrysler have any future as a car maker? No. I think that Chrysler's terminal. In your judgment, then, is there any good reason to bail out Chrysler through a massive U.S. aid program? I really think the, the company's terminal. This show has never been solely about investments. We've talked about anything that affected people and their money. And my guests have included some of the most powerful persons in the world. Business leaders who ran for president, present and future cabinet officials, world-class economists, and the two men who have been chairman of the Federal Reserve Board for more than two decades. The first thing we've got to do is realize that the market is only liquid if the individual investor is in the market. Now then, a lot of people that used to think he's a nuisance would love to see him down there today. Uh, the big institution was very attractive, he's still attractive, but he must have a small investor too. He's essential to provide liquidity in the market. The price of oil today bears no relationship to economic reality. There's no relationship to the production cost of oil, to the cost of alternative sources of energy. It was a political decision on the part of a cartel to quadruple the price of oil arbitrarily because they control 67 percent of the world's proven reserves. Paul, let's turn to the rest of the economy. You said earlier this year that you would be mightily concerned if the deficit in the federal budget went over 80 billion dollars. According to Congress's reckoning this week, it's likely to top 72 billion. How concerned are you? Is this likely to destroy our recovery from the recession? Well, I think it's big. I, uh, I don't think it's going to destroy the recovery from the recession. The trouble with these deficits is uh, uh, not so much the size of the deficit today, when there's a lot of unutilized capacity in the economy. But are we on a course that carries this continuing along with these kinds of deficits as the economy does recover? And the economy is, uh, has begun to recover. It's been recovering rather vigorously for some months. 
and it took me time looking ahead to begin seeing reducing that deficit, and I would remain very disturbed if those deficits don't get reduced as, as we move ahead and as the economy moves ahead. We have to balance our social aims and desires against our investment uh, needs. The more you spend in the social area, the less you'll have to spend in investment. Investment means jobs, and you're going to have to watch your trade-off here. The more you go for one, the less you'll have in the other. And the only way you can make it up for your social aims is to have the government of the United States spend the money. And therein lies the problem. If the government decides to come into the capital markets in uh, a large way, there's less capital available for everyone else. If the government cuts back on its desires, there will be enough capital to go around. Seems to me you're suggesting that we are going to go a little bit downhill in this world. Is that correct? I think so, yes. I think that uh, when you begin to look at the world of the 1990s, uh, I think the United States comes down a notch or two. Will we live worse or just live not as relatively better? I think not as relatively better. Look, you know, there's a lot of talk about the United States losing its sort of per capita income uh, uh, leadership in the world. But the real issue is that the average American household has got the best homes in the world, it's got the best sets of appliance, the best telecommunications. The average American still lives far better than the average anything else. The trouble is, is that the gap, which used to be huge, is now beginning to narrow. It's going to narrow further. Milton, we only have about a minute left. Let's see if we can hopscotch a little bit. Should we abolish the Federal Reserve Board? Yes. What would you replace it with? A computer. <laughs> and what would you tell the computer to do? I would tell the computer to see to it that the money supply goes up at exactly 2% <clears throat> per year or as close there to as it can manage on a week-by-week, -week, month by month, year by year basis. Is there any form of government regulation that you favor? Absolutely. There are many forms. I favor the form of government regulation which says that if you murder your wife, you go to jail. I favor the form of government regulation which says you have to drive on the right side of the road. Ken, you've never lost faith in the power of government to cure economic ills, but most of the country apparently has. How do you explain that? Oh, there's no, <clears throat> no doubt about that, uh, Lou. Uh, the, my generation is responsible uh, through the Keynesian Revolution, the Welfare Revolution. A uh, great many Americans, a majority of Americans, have become comfortable, happy, and uh, inevitably conservative, uh, at least those that vote. Welcome, welcome. We're just delighted to have you with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Please. After that build-up, I'm <coughs> a little trepidatious. Here. Don't you be trepidatious. I know you're intimidated, but take it easy. You may have a career if you do well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Forbes is often called the happy capitalist, and one look just now will tell you why. In addition to his notable holdings, he's the chairman, he's the editor-in-chief as well of Forbes, a business magazine founded in 1917 by his father, a Scottish immigrant. He's now one of the largest and most respected in the field. Malcolm, you were born rich. You've become a heck of a lot richer. But most of the public attention, as I already suggested, is centered on the way you've spent all that money. Now, your father, they tell me, was a pretty tight Scot. How would he feel about all this publicity? Well, I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't mind the publicity. It's the price that would bother him. <laughs> was, 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 was he stingy in expenditures? Was that your household atmosphere? No, he wasn't stingy. He was stingy in non-essential expenditures, of which he considered uh, over-generous allowances in that category. I remember whenever we left the living room to go into dinner, we were all taught to turn out the lights on the way into the dining room. Uh, he wasn't stingy. He just had a great respect for money, and I've developed a great affection for it. <laughs> well, what is your attitude toward money? <clears throat> that it's a very nice thing to have. Well, parts of your book read eerily like a script for what's been happening in Europe this month. For example, you wrote presciently, and I quote, a common currency will be the final step in a completely integrated market, and the European economic community has moved toward this eventuality. But this surrender of sovereignty touches the very heart of the nation state. To lose control of the right to issue currency is an attack against one of sovereignty's most valued rights should we expect next in this European currency crisis? Well, I think it was almost inevitable, Lou, that uh, what happened last week was going to happen. <clears throat> Once you have 
disparate economies and disparate nation states uh, and a market as big as we now have. Uh, fixed exchange rates are an artifact of the past. <coughs> the float is the only thing that will act as a shock absorber between disparate national policies. We Americans are notorious for our short memory spans, but you and I have been around for a while. Can you recall any time when raising taxes actually reduced a deficit? I think you're going to see this time, with what we lock in in the way of this program, a very material reduction in that deficit, and I haven't seen that in a long time. And I'll tell you who reacts to it. The bond market has. They believe it. You're seeing uh, almost 100 basis points drop in interest rates, and that is a substantial stimulus to this economy. There's no question that the bond market has endorsed what's going on in the economy, but isn't it a bit weird for a Democratic president to be finding his chief support in the bond market? I think it's delightful. In October 1982, a then camera-shy money manager from Boston made his television debut. His mutual fund had the best five-year record in investing, and soon he would become a household name, at least in the Lily Tomlin and Don Rickles households. Obviously, the typical investor as an individual doesn't have the time to spend all the time you spend on all this, but is there anything he or she can learn from what you do? I, I, I'm amazed that the average investor is out there in some industry. They're in the polyvinyl chloride industry, they're in insurance, they're in textiles, and they're gonna see those industries turn. And they're not gonna buy those stocks. They're gonna go buy some stock from somebody in the National Guard, or they're gonna have something on television on biogenetics. They have a big edge in me. I work awful hard, and they're months ahead of me. They can be in the healthcare industry, they're seeing new products. They should work on that, on that that they have in front of them. As they used to tell writers, write what you know, you're telling them buy what you know. Yes. What, do you, what would you tell them not to do? What do you think are the mistakes well, people I, make? Well, uh, this is a common mistake I do. I think people buy stocks because they've fallen from price X to two-thirds of X or half of X. On that basis alone, they're buying a stock. That's called bottom fishing in the stock market. Very, very difficult. I've had a rough go with it. Standard Oil Ohio this year fell from 90 to 60, and I told everybody, this stock is not going to go any lower. Then it went to 50, and I said, this is it, no lower. As it went through 40, I said to the people, this is it. Finally, when it got down under 30 and people said, what do you think is Ohio? I said, what, do, what does Ohio do? I don't, I don't know that company. <laughs> so, yeah, it, yeah, you, I absolutely backed away from it. You, you didn't like to buy low. Hmm? One of the pleasures of hosting this program has been meeting some of the most successful investors of all time. Back in 1995, I interviewed a stripling of 98 years about the markets. Phil, what's the single most important thing that you have learned about investing over the past three quarters of a century? Patience. <laughs> patience. Tell, expand on that. How do you apply patience? Well, I buy things <coughs> for myself and for clients <coughs> to hold for five years, ten years. Of course, I won't be around for ten years or any sizable part of it. But uh, You've fooled us before. You could fool us again. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> One uh, of the most remarkable things about you is that you don't rest on your laurels. You're out there every day as an active investor. What do you think of this stock market today? I think it's uh, dangerous at present levels. <coughs> uh, to uh, a lot of froth on the boom, I think uh, probably we're in for a maybe something like 1987 when the market went down 500 points in one day. <clears throat> Perhaps we'll have a repeat of that. But in the long run, this is a great country, uh, despite being uh, having too much government. And I think in the long run, why uh, the market will recover and people who buy the right stocks and sit on them are going to do very well. What do you do, given your experience, when you think there may be too much froth, when you think there may be a major correction, even a crash? Do you sell all your stocks? <laughs> no, I really don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> you just show I, that patience, huh? I bought them for the long pull, and I, I can, uh, I've seen a lot of recessions, and I can live through them, and I can do it again, perhaps.
1984, after we had already been on the air for 14 years, I decided that viewers by then could trust me enough not just to be showing home movies when I brought my father, 87-year-old financial journalist Merrill Stanley Rukeyser, to Owings Mills. He quickly became our viewers' favorite guest, the ageless boy wonder of Wall Street. Wall Street's never been popular, and uh, it, it's an easy uh, uh, plaything for the demagogues. And I think that th those who speak about fairness and the fairness of an incumbent president and a tax bill are not only attacking the incumbent, but they're attacking the whole system because the nature of a competitive system is inequality. We pay people according to their productivity. If you want to pay, pay people equally, then I recommend communism. They mm -hmm. promise it, they don't always perform it. Well, at 87, you belong to one of the constituencies that was singled out for special attention this week. Uh, how do you feel about being described as a senior citizen? I resent it. I'm against hyphenated Americans, whether <laughs> German Americans or Jewish Americans or Italian Americans or gay Americans or sober Americans. I mean, you think you're just a citizen. The big story this past year in the economy was all the corporate mergers. Have we ever had this before? Yeah, we've had mergers before, but I think uh, there's some aspects of it uh, that need uh, a little straightening out. I think it's a conflict of interest when management uh, puts itself in conflict with the stockholders and uh, makes a leverage buyout. They, they've been hired to work for the stockholders, not to trade against them. You were quoted earlier this year in one magazine with something that still sounds pretty good to me. You talk about constants. You said, there's no sure investment, no chance of being right every time. All you have to work with is careful selection, persistent supervision, and diversification to cushion your mistakes. Successful investors know themselves and do their own thinking. They don't react to each market fluctuation. They find a good investment and let it pay off. Would you want to amend that at all now? No, uh, that was pretty clever of me. I didn't remember saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still uh, a holder of common stocks? I am, but I, uh, with the advice and consent of my heirs and air signs, I took advantage of my age and bought a non-refund annuity so I could afford to ho hold common stocks that only paid a small rate on the purchase, the market value. But when you were investing for your own account, you still believed in the future of the stock market? Yes, and I believed that I was assuming certain risks. I didn't think I was making a riskless adventure. You're obviously not, we're not a newsletter writer because they don't have any risk. They just tell us they know the answer. Well, if you subscribe for about 60 to $80 a year, you can have this riskless adventure. The only thing is they, they run out of town after a big break. Your life covers a whole cycle in American life in terms of our international position. We were a debtor nation. We became a creditor nation. Now we're a debtor nation again. How can we become more competitive in America? By a return to excellence. We all miss him. The 1980s and 1990s brought a new type of business leader to the fore. There was the corporate raider and the heretofore anonymous CEO as coat figure. Boone, well, you say you're the champion of the small stockholder. Uh, the British corporate ra raider Sir James Goldsmith says, and I'll quote him, that he does it, uh, says takeovers are, quote, for the public good, but that's not why I do it. I do it to make money. Isn't that really your number one motivation? Uh, Lou, I'd be, I'd be sitting here lying to you if I told you that we did not uh, expect to make money out of these deals. At the same time, if you'll go back and, and look at what we've done with the stockholders, and, you know, I, it, if you just take the four deals we're talking about, there was $13 billion in profit. That profit went right back into uh, to this economy, and uh, it's moved around very quickly, some back into stocks and whatever else, but it creates jobs. It does a lot of things in America. So. I like to see that capital moved around, and I like to see people make money off of uh, off these deals, and they do. I Good. don't like to see managements that's, that their stocks sell uh, at a huge discount to appraised value. That does annoy me. One of the reasons we pay CEOs as much as we do is that they have to sustain more headaches than the average person. Just this month, it was revealed that a memo from a, an executive in your old Long Island district had trashed low-asset customers and suggested that the firm wasn't very interested in handling them. Is that the firm's policy? 
You could have gone the whole evening without bringing that up. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's just so far uh, from uh, the policy that brought Merrill Lynch uh, to his it, position it's, today. It's uh, diametrically opposed to the policy that brought us to where we are. It's diametrically opposed to the policy uh, that we have in place. Uh, and certainly it's not something we're proud of. I think the young man made a, a mistake. I know he regrets it, uh, but certainly this is not something uh, uh, that we will contend with uh, nor approve. So. My first brokerage trade was for a grand total of $285. Is there a home for the $285 purchaser? For you, Lou, I'll make sure there is. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm up to 300 now. Okay, I can handle that also. <laughs> you have been a leader in Wall Street thinking for a long time now. Do you think the boldness of this merger encouraged Daimler, Benz, and Chrysler? Uh, I think there's been a lot of deals since uh, we've announced our deal. And uh, I think that what, <coughs> I, what I like seeing is uh, that we've created a new management concept called co-CEO, which uh, I also see happened uh, in that deal. While the relationship <coughs> between you and Sandy is obviously very close and you present yourself as equals in this merger, uh, Sandy's chief aide, Jamie Dimon, has been named president of the new city group. And there's a lot of speculation that Travelers is going to be the dominant partner here. Is this incorrect speculation? I think so. I think what we did is Sandy and I went away about 10 days ago and with Jamie Dimon and a number of other people. And we agreed as to how we wanted to run the company. Payne Weber had record earnings this past year. Is this a t good time to sell the company? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time to buy some more companies in our business. We're in the early stages of a very long-term opportunity. Uh, are, you, are you looking for somebody to buy you? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. You first came to public attention with Apple. Mm -hmm. In recent weeks, it's been one of the failure stories of Wall Street and indeed of the American economy. What went wrong at Apple? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, Apple, I haven't been there in a long time, but my perception we is... We won't blame you for what's happened <laughs> in the last 10 years. Yeah, no, I mean, my perception <laughs> may not be complete, but uh, from the way I see it, I mean, Apple was a company that was based on innovation. When I left Apple 10 years ago, we, we were 10 years ahead of anybody else. It took Microsoft 10 years to copy Windows. The problem was is that, that Apple stood still. I think the way out is not to slash and burn, it's to innovate. That's how Apple got to its glory, and I think that's how Apple could return to it. We've seen a great deal of cost-cutting and fare-cutting in the industry as a whole. What's the future for the other side of the equation, better passenger comfort and service? I think it's very limited. Uh, very limited? Very limited. The reality is that the airline industry is intensely competitive. We do what our customers have told us uh, they want us to do. I made a speech the other day, and I, I made the observation that, that uh, generally speaking, the public has said they would rather have more seats in the airplane and lower prices. And they've given us a very clear signal about that. We have tried on several occasions taking seats out, and the public each time has said we will not pay for that extra space in either money or by waiting for a flight on your comfortable airline, when we're through with our meeting, we're going to go home, even if we go home on scrunched up air, instead of generous Bob's airline. <laughs> uh, I accept your forecast, though it disheartens me. <laughs> <laughs> what in economic policy is this Congress capable of? What do you think is the most likely result? Steve? I think it's going to do some good, although it's not going to, as you say, have a be a miraculous Congress, but I think they will make a serious effort to cut the capital gains tax and some other taxes, which will be good. I think there will be a very serious effort on welfare reform, and I think you're going to start to see real hearings on the most exciting tax proposal. Dick Armey, who will become the majority leader in the House for a flat tax, 17 percent rate, no tax on dividends, interest, capital gains, or estates, and for a family of four, $36,000 of tax-free income. That's going to send the economy off like a rocket, and I think it'll happen after the 96 elections. Akio, is Japan an unfair player in the world economic game? I don't think so, uh, because that maybe that is a uh, difference of the viewpoint. For example, from us, sometimes American looks unfair. For example, American auto manufacturer. Uh, comparing Japan's auto export, but on the other hand, they are buying from Japan automobile under their label, 
every year increasing. So such an attitude for us looks unfair. They weren't perfect, but neither, alas, was your genial host. Don, welcome. Delighted to have you north of the Mason-Dixon line. Thank you. As a number of our more astute viewers pointed out, Maryland is actually south of the Mason-Dixon line. And then there was the time I tripped up on English literature. And finally, let's really get out the perfume and lace for the most adorable creature of 1987, the stock market. Only Shakespeare, I fear, will do. So let's try, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. 1900, 2000, 2100, 2200. Keep it up, baby. You're beautiful. OK, first things first. Let's stop all those great poets and shocked English teachers from spinning in their graves. For this was the week when I finally found out what you people out there really care about. And as a result, tonight I have to make my first public correction in 17 years of Wall Street Week, as hundreds upon hundreds of literate viewers have triumphantly, nay, gleefully pointed out, I was less than entirely accurate last week when, in the course of offering some Valentine verses of my own, I suggested that the sonnet, including the words, How do I love thee, let me count the ways, was by Shakespeare. From every corner of this noble land, by post, by phone, by telegraph, viewers rushed to shout, gotcha, shame, and at last. Many, to be sure, tried to be kind as they happily stabbed at my high school report card. As Mary Sutton Gilchrist of Syracuse, New York, affectionately put it, how do we love you? More ways than are countable. Your talent with verses is just insurmountable. But one, your last, I admit, left me frowning that wasn't Shakespeare, it was E. Barrett Browning. Others, not so generous, fired at me with verse that was not so much blank as point blank. Wrote Joseph Carlton of Palo Alto, California, roses are red, violets are blue. Louis Rukeyser made a boo-boo. <laughs> Then there was the time when, having single-handedly boosted the stock market to a series of all-time highs, I decided it was safe to do some traveling. As it turns out, I didn't know my own strength. Well, OK, so what did I do on my summer vacation this year? I went to Moscow, and they had a coup. I kid you not, there I was sleeping peacefully in my hotel room in the very capital of the evil empire, when a bunch of hardline communists had the temerity to try to overthrow the government. Who did those guys think they were dealing with? Well, they ought to know by now, because I sure showed them. By the end of the week, as you may have heard, the coup was defeated, world communism had crumbled, the Baltic states were liberated, the evil empire had disintegrated, and the Soviet Union was history. The nerve of those guys. Now my only question is, where should I go on vacation next year? One of the nicest things about this program is the warm family relationship we've always had with our viewers. Five years ago, we decided it was time to answer a vast array of viewer questions on such world-shattering issues as, who writes my material? Do the panelists get to see the questions in advance? And other cosmic queries to which all America was apparently breathlessly awaiting the answers. It was designed to show you everything you could possibly want to know about what you don't see on the screen every Friday. If it's Friday, this must be Owings Mills. I've been coming to the studios of Maryland Public Television to do this program almost every Friday for the past quarter century. It began as a bit of moonlighting. I was already a commentator for ABC News and continued as a full-time ABC political and economic analyst for the next three years. Since then, I've been out on my own the other six days of the week. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Lou. Owings Mills, which I like to think of as the financial nerve center of the universe, is actually a suburb northwest of Baltimore. 
And though I live hundreds of miles away, this building has become a sort of second home. I generally arrive in the early afternoon, and my first important job is to have lunch. Hi. Hello, Daddy. Oh, I love your outfit. Thank you. When I was a young newspaper reporter, an editor once told me that serious journalists should always order ham and cheese on rye, and thereby save their creative powers for their work. I then read every comment that viewers have sent me that week, and answer as many letters as I can. We really do have the most loyal and astute audience in the world, and I always look forward to finding out what they're thinking now. Next, I work the phones and check the news a bit, work on a few future projects, and don't actually start to write that night's show until about 4.30 p.m. And yes, I do write my own stuff, every syllable of it. Whose stuff did you think I wrote? I check over the graphics for that night's show, making any last-minute changes, chat with Rich Dubroff, who has been producing the show for the past 14 years and is one of the three most conscientious people in the history of television, and around six, begin writing that night's opening commentary. If inspiration doesn't immediately appear, I look for him in the hall. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Hi, Larry. How are you? Meanwhile, the panelists and guests begin to arrive. While I'm typing, they're eating, having makeup applied, and getting acquainted. <laughs> Natalie Seltz, our on-air hostess in the role of Miss Smith, is making them feel a little more at ease. The crew is getting ready, and so is our director, George Benneman. George is the only other person besides me who has been with the show since it started, and he's been our director for 19 years. He's also an extremely conservative dresser. If all goes well, we pre-tape the show starting about 7.45 p.m. Eastern Time. Otherwise, we do it live at 8.30. If we're taping, Natalie will lead the group into the studio around 7.15. It takes me about 90 minutes to write my opening, so it's usually close to 7.30 when I finish up and pop in to get a little makeup. Please remember that there's only so much they can do with the raw material I provide. Next, it's into the studio, about five minutes before showtime. No time, of course, for anything so boring as a rehearsal. I'll quickly check my opening position and say a friendly hello to the guest, whom I will not have seen until then. For a lot of our guests, it's their first time on television and I try to make them feel at home. <laughs> Three, two, one, showtime. Okay, folks. The show itself is the easy part, and usually lots of fun. Afterward, those guests who want them get some photographs taken. Most enjoy watching the show with us as it goes out to viewers, and then we'll work on next week's program. On the weeks we use viewer questions, I'll pick them and have them sent to the panelists, who can do the necessary research instead of answering them off the cuff. Even for certified geniuses like our panelists, that's usually not a bad idea. It's generally close to midnight when I leave the building, thinking about next week's show and how we can do it better. I'm determined that we're going to go on doing it until we get it right. Well, I hope we've gotten it right for you more often than not. One thing I know we've learned is that what happens in the world of money is inseparable from what's happening in the rest of the world. It's no coincidence that a global turn toward political and economic freedom has coincided with unprecedented success for investors. No sensible politicians, at home or abroad, sneer at business success these days. They're far more likely to be taking credit for it. Deeds may not always match words, but free enterprise, free trade, free markets permeate the international rhetoric of the early 21st century, to a degree that would have seemed fantastic 30 years ago. And that makes the outlook for the next 30 years even more thrilling. No one, 
not even our famous elves, knows exactly what the next three decades will bring. But it's sure to be quite a ride for you, your family, and your money. And we'll be doing our darndest to keep you in the front ranks of that ride, ahead of the financial curves, and having a lot of fun along the way. I can't wait to see what happens next and every week after that, and we want to share that ride with you until we get it right. I'm Louis Rukeyser, and I'm awfully glad you came to help us celebrate. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, the first 30 years is produced in association with Rukeyser Television Incorporated and by Maryland Public Television. To order a video cassette of Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, the first 30 years, call 1 800 736 1123. The cost is $35.90, including shipping and handling. Credit cards are accepted. This is PBS.